Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rosemary Liberti. I am a partner with the law firm of Dilbert Paxson in Center City, Philadelphia. I'm also the Philadelphia president this year. And I welcome everyone to today's webinar, CPA, A Guide to the Citizens Act and Commercial Real Estate for the Rest of Us. We have joining us today two former past presidents of Crew Philadelphia and longtime members of Crew Philadelphia, uh, Terry Johnson and Lisa Keene, who will be introducing themselves in a moment. Before I turn the program over, I'd like to take a moment to share my screen, and hopefully I do this correctly this time, and thank our sponsors. We could not hold these types of events or support our mission to advance the success of women in commercial real estate without our sponsors. So if you give me one second, I am hopefully going to properly share my screen. And there we go. Terry and Lisa, am I sharing my screen properly this time? We see the sponsors. Yeah. So uh, our premier lead sponsors, Arcadia, Skyscraper Sponsors, Dorothy Paxton, Wiscus Bank, Brandywine Realty Trust, White Williams, First American Title Insurance Company, Capstan, KSX, Sanero, Herman Miller, Target Building Construction. Our high-rise sponsors, Skanska, Spectrum, Fox Rothschild LLP, NFI, Jay Davis, O'Donnell and Nakarado, Brookfield Properties, Fidelity National Title and Chicago Title Insurance Company, Erwin and Layton, Archer, Clemens Construction Company, and Elliott Lewis. Our groundbreaker sponsors, Equis Capital Partners Limited, Greyhawk, Hayworth, Land Services USA, NV5, Bach and Clark, and our affiliate sponsors, Advantage Sport and Fitness, Sport, Interface, Rethink Innovations, and Trans American Office Park. So again, thank you to our sponsors. I'm going to stop my share, and I'm going to turn it over to Terry and Lisa. Hi, everybody. This is Terry Johnson here, and um, we are Lisa Keen and I are. Um, we're really excited to um, present. I'm no CPA: A Guide to the CARES Act and Commercial Real Estate for the Rest of Us. Now that hopefully has not put you to sleep, <laughs> just the title. You know, Lisa and I were talking when um, it, I guess during this whole COVID thing and you'd get it, talk to an old friend. It was like, you know, it was just so much fun. We, we, um, we had been asked to maybe do this and we thought, you know, what would be really interesting? And that would be, there's so much talk about like the CARES Act and how it's impacting people on an individual level. But what about from a real estate perspective? So picture this, you're on your Zoom um, networking call, cocktail hour, and somebody starts talking about all the tax savings they've got through the CARES Act. And I don't know about you, but one of the things I love about crew is that, you know, if you um, don't know something uh, and you learn it through your crew um, connection and you learn enough about it to be dangerous or at least to ask the right questions, it really enhances you as a professional. So Lisa and I, with that in mind, put this together and kind of split up the, the um, presentation between the two of us. And I will say that I think that hopefully you have to tell us at the end if it was over your head or not, but we're going to really try to make it kind of high level, how you, you know, how does this really, what does this mean and why, and also kind of more tactically, how does it work? So with that being said, we are going to launch in and the first thing order of business is to introduce ourselves so i'll go first um, i'm terry johnson i'm the managing partner of capstan tax strategies we work with owners of real estate to help them save money on taxes and we do this primarily through cost segregation and other tax strategies that help owners save money on taxes so we work a lot directly with real estate owners but primarily through cpa firms so a little plug for my friend lisa keen <laughs> together for years. We're not only good friends, but we um, work together and on Client Matters together. And I do a lot of work with her firm across the country, actually. And Lisa was the one that introduced me. So it was a great crew connection that she got me years ago involved in um, Eisner Amper. So um, I appreciate that. And um, as, as Rosemary mentioned, I'm a past president of Crew Philadelphia. I was on the Crew Network board. I've sort of lived and breathed Crew over the years, as my friend Lisa has as well. And I mean, it's just really fun to be here today. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lisa. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Keen. I'm the director at Eisner Amper in the Philadelphia office. Um, we have offices throughout the country with about 1,900 employees, of which 200 are dedicated to the real estate industry. Um, I handle all aspects of clients' needs, whether they're corporate or individual. And like Terry, I'm a past president of Crew Philadelphia and to some degree spent a, a long time on the crew board and have uh, gotten the title of historian because for a period of time when information was needed, I was the go-to person. <laughs> So, looking forward to talking to you today. Thank you. You can go. Okay. So, just to give you a brief overview of today's agenda, um, we're going to talk about where we are right now um, in real estate related to the COVID-19 and the CARES Act and why cash flow is king and give you some nuggets as to how you can actually um, find savings, um, which translates to cash, and also how that brings value to your clients. So um, we will do that by going through a couple of different aspects of the CARES Act specific to real estate. And if we have time at the end, we'll also talk about a couple of other items, which um, you can also you know, keep in your arsenal so that you um, in interacting with your clients maybe can you know bring it to them and have some value um, and enhance your relationship. And then at the end we'll answer some questions. So just to start off and talk about where we are. So I think I was thinking about this today and it's kind of like we've all gotten over I think the initial shock of what COVID-19 has done to our world. But, um, and we're like in the middle. So this, this slide is perfect because no matter who you are, we're sort of like stuck right in the middle of the sandwich. Um, so, you know, for those of us where we've learned to work from home, you know, we're trying to figure out when will we get back into our offices and when will life go back to normal. Um, likewise, with real estate property owners, um, they're stuck in the, in the middle too because, you know, they have tenants that are trying to get back to um, becoming operational in their space. Um, likewise, you know, they're trying to figure out how to make the buildings, you know, safe and compliant. And at the same time, the, the real estate property owners also still have to continue to make their, you know, payments to the lender. So they're trying to, everybody's trying to figure out where they're going to get the cash to do this. So that's pretty much, you know, I think a good, overview of maybe how we all feel, at least I think how Terry and I are feeling about it right now, wouldn't you say? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, um, you know, the important thing is to actually for all the parties involved is to actually just really come and work together. And I think this is something that, you know, we haven't experienced before and this has affected everybody on probably more than one level. So, um, you know, the thing really is, is the, the key to all of this is probably communication. So for each of the parties involved um, with real estate, it's important for the property owners to communicate with their lenders and know what their rights are under their mortgage agreement. Um, you know, speak to them and, and communicate with their tenants regarding if there's lease alternatives. And just to like keep the flow of communication working because I think everybody is really doing their very best to try and just get through this. So property owners, you know, in some cases they've, um, you know, pushed out tenant leases for a couple of months just to kind of, you know, work with their tenants because the tenants aren't having cash come in. So if they're not having cash come in, how are they paying, you know, how are they paying on their, their monthly rent? And likewise, the property owners still need to have the money come in so that they can take care of their obligations as well. So as a tenant, you know, you want to just know your rights under your lease and then know what remedies you might have. And, and once again, communication. So communication is the key for each of the parties in dealing with one another. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. So, so with that said, it's how do we get there? 
So, um, and that's kind of what, you know, we do. We look for opportunities. And as Terry said, we work together and find ways in which we can bring value to property owners and tenants. And we're going to talk specifically about, you know, a couple of nuggets that came through the CARES Act. And what it really did is it provided, um, in my mind, some flexibility. Because now there are some options. The rules aren't so black and white as they were under um, the prior act that we were actually working on. So there are some opportunities to um, go back to 2018 and 19 and see if there are things that you need to do that you might be able to take some items back into an earlier year, free up some cash, and then that would help you get through the future time period. Um, so a couple of the items that are specific to real estate, one is net operating losses and carry back. Um, the second is business interest limitations and some temporary regulations that were put in place and the qualified improvement property. So we're gonna delve into each one of these and basically try and keep it um, at a simplistic level and hopefully not too technical. But as with anything with the government, there's lots of um, there's lots of items that actually affect things one way or the other. It's probably the best way to say it. You know, at least so, I, at least I just wanted to add something there that or was it like in April, where when the CARES Act came out and there was literally clarification coming out almost on a daily basis and we like with our company we probably blog maybe once a month we were blogging and sometimes two to three times a week just to try to like tell our clients like oh and then you can do this or this is how you're going to get this and and so i know you guys are probably doing it times 10 because you had a much broader scope but i, I just wanted to mention that it was like coming it out really fast for about a month uh -huh. Very fast, and in, in place of a normal April 15th tax season, it was like learning something completely new and then being able to advise at the same time, and as you said, changing on a daily basis. So uh, it's definitely been, been an interesting experience, right? <laughs> so um, the first one that we're going to talk about is the, uh, the business interest deduction. where it basically raised the limitation that was put in to the prior tax act, which was known as the TCJA or the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, which went in place in 2018. And that act allowed for 30% business deduction. And under the CARES Act, they added a little bit of flexibility and raised that to a 50% um, of earnings deduction for 2019 and 2020 only. So, you know, once again, I think the government was trying to uh, alleviate and find flexi some flexibility so that people had some options of where they could actually take advantage of it. So the other one is the temporary repeal of the 80% income limitation for net operating loss deduction before the year 2021. So prior to the TCJA Act, which we'll refer to a lot during this hour, um, you were allowed to carry back net operating losses in full under the act which went into place in 2018, you were only allowed an 80% income limitation. Um, they've actually um, added some more flexibility to that for a short period of time. And we'll have a slide in a, a little bit later in the presentation that will actually be simpler to follow than probably the words written here. So the other thing that is really one of the big things that came through in, in the CARES Act is that um, it allows for qualified improvement property to um, go back to a 15-year class life. And that one's huge. And we'll get into that one in some detail later on. So speaking about the net operating loss rules, as I mentioned before, 
the TCJA Act allows it to be imposed on 80% of your taxable income. Um, whereas prior to that, you were allowed to apply the entire amount. So, and you had certain carry back periods and carry forward periods. Um, if you look at the slide, you actually now um, have to look at what year your net operating loss was generated and then see what the carry back period is eligible for or the carry forward period. And then also take into account what percentage of income you can offset with a net operating loss. So, um, and just to interrupt, not, Lisa, just to interrupt you, I mean, everybody, if you're not completely tracking with what some of the like net operating losses, if you don't deal with this on a on a day to day basis, think in terms of you're losing your shirt this year, and you have a way to go back in time when you were making a lot of money. Lisa? and be able to, in effect, go back instead of just forward. Is that is that a good way to say it, or is that a little bit too simple? Uh, that's a good way to say it, because um, definitely, you know, what they're giving is the flexibility once again. You know, you may have had a good tax, you may have had a good year with income in, you know, 17 or, you know, 18, but now 19, um, and 19 might have been profitable as well, but you know, most people are expecting that 2020 is going to be a really rocky year for everyone. So it's allowing some flexibility of, you know, where, in whatever year you generate this loss, you have some options that you may be able to go back and get some cash um, returned to you, which once again, you know, that's the key is the cash is king. Um, and if not, you can carry those losses forward in the future year, uh, depending upon if you aren't able to carry it back where you didn't have a profit in the earlier years. So, um, like I said, it's just flexibility that you have options, and it's not, it's not the easiest thing to follow for even the seasoned CPAs, um, because when you carry certain items back, you have to recalculate certain other items in those years. So it's not necessarily a dollar for dollar item. So in concept, it provides the flexibility, but um, it's something that probably has to be uh, looked into and analyzed to see the, the pure benefit and where it's best to be used is the easiest way to say it. So, um, and in doing that, once again, with the flexibility, you know, it, it, it's in terms of can you accelerate deductions in one year or defer revenue to a different year, and would that benefit you? So um, there's two things to note about this. This applies to both businesses as well as individuals. Um, if you have an NOL, previously shown on return, you could either go back and amend and possibly create an NOL where one didn't exist before. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, you have to be careful that it's not, it's not a simple exercise. It does require some analysis to make sure that it's not triggering anything else within that tax year that would cause it to um, be unfavorable. So um, that's the first item to note. The second item is that if you're a corporation, you can carry back the NOL to a tax year which had a higher tax rate because the tax rate was 35% before 2018 um, versus the 21% now with the Tax uh, Cuts Job Act. So you can look for ways to maximize your deductions once again shift um, or decrease revenue, create an NOL in an earlier period, and thereby um, be able to get a refund for taxes which you might have paid at that higher rate. So that, that's truly a saving to, to explore if that situation is something that you're involved in. So in terms of the business interest deduction limitation, this was something new with the Tax uh, Cuts and Jobs Act. And um, what it did is it limited 
um, the interest expense deduction to the sum of your business interest income or 30% of your adjusted taxable income. And it applies at the corporate level and then flows through to the individuals as well. And it carries through on K-1s that individuals receive. This was something that was new. Um, and you had the option in 2018, if you wanted to, you could elect out of it. However, the trade-off to electing out was that you then had to depreciate the assets over longer periods than otherwise had been done. And once you made that election, you could not take bonus depreciation and the election was uh, is an irrevocable election. However, certain small businesses that were below a certain dollar amount, of the 26 million for this year, um, 25 million in 18, um, they were considered exempt from it. So that's what the, that's what went into play in 2018. In 2019, they came along and they increased that deductible from the 30% to a 50% rate. Um, so once again, they're giving some flexibility. And if a taxpayer does not want to apply this, you, they need to physically elect out. But if they want to use it for years beginning in 19 and 20, they need to actually elect in. So once again, just it's all about the flexibility and looking at your situation and seeing what works best for you. And at least I'm gonna have, when we talk about the qualified improvement property, and the bonus on that, we'll come back to that as an example of the, some people are deciding to change their election just because of that. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to talk about was kind of, so Lisa's helped us sort of big picture, all these opportunities that are out there. And, you know, the, the folks that are dealing like the CFOs of, real estate companies are all over this stuff. I mean, and they're trying, you know, working with folks like Lisa to figure out what is the best way to go, what's the best strategy. So I would assume, Lisa, that you guys really pivoted during the normal tax season and were focused on this planning, and now you're in tax season, is that correct? <laughs> so it's Absolutely. Just, it's just kind of been a, an ongoing tax season forever. Um, so what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the bonus depreciation that came out under the new tax law and then what I do which is cost segregation and so we're going to go a little bit tactical because so we're talking big picture about what can be done but how do you get some of these um deductions and and so one of the things I think just as a a concept I wish I had one of those polls to ask all of you of how many of you even know what bonus depreciation is so what I'm going to do is kind of try to explain it so that you understand and then you can say, oh, bonus depreciation is a really good thing, but it has some limitations. Just like Lisa said, there's always planning involved in all these strategies. But um, so, so bonus depreciation is this tax incentive that permits you to literally immediately take that deduction in the first year or a percentage of it based on what the, what the percentage of the bonus depreciation is in play um, on the purchase of eligible business assets in addition to other depreciation. So when did this start? Well, back in 2001, after 9-11, Congress was really trying to figure out how to get the, the economy stimulated. So they came up with this idea, the bonus depreciation. And what they did is they said, hey, if you either start a new construction pro um, project or you're renovating, so it wasn't for acquisitions, it was just on something new, if you end up with a depreciable life under 20 years or less, you can take this bonus depreciation. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you had, um, you were doing a fit out of a, a tenant improvement for a million dollars and you were in a 50% bonus time frame. And let's say that 30% of that, that new construction project or renovation was eligible for bonus depreciation. You could take half, 50% of that in the current year. So if you're looking at a million dollars and we could accelerate 30% of that, 
that's 300,000, she'd get this additional deduction of $150,000. So that's how it, it kind of worked. And so what we saw is almost on a yearly basis, you would see this some way, this bonus depreciation as an incentive would get extended. So it's been not every single year, but it's been around for a long time. So it just kind of makes accelerating depreciation that much better. And I'm gonna talk about what that actually means in just a second. So just to give you a little bit of background before we get into how it works, is that what I do is cost segregation studies that basically gives the accountants the data that they need to support these tax strategies and accelerating the depreciation. So it's been around, uh, approved by the IRS since 1998. The whole objective is to accelerate depreciation deductions. And so as all these new tax laws come out year after year, you know, we always say, oh my gosh, how's this gonna affect the acceleration of depreciation? But sure enough, in every case, it's, it's become the cost segregation really is the tool to use to get those deductions. So it's just become more and more valuable over time. So what I'm gonna do now is just give you a little lesson in how accelerated depreciation works. So let's say that you buy a commercial building, an office building for $10 million. That is a commercial building. So you would depreciate that asset over 39 years. So what you do is you say you have the $10 million and let's say you're allocating 20% to land and you can't depreciate land. So you take that 20%, you take 10 million less the 20%. So that's $8 million that we have on what we call a depreciable basis. So now what we do is we go in and do a study and our goal is to move as much out of that 39 year bucket in faster lives. So five and seven years are, are for personal property. And I'm not just talking about desks and computers. I'm talking about, you know, if you have the outlet that supports your computer and your phone, and all that, all that outlet and all the wiring back to the box is considered personal property because it's supporting equipment. Um, so that, or things like you know, your flooring and, and your, your um, the new wood flooring that everybody's putting in um, or carpet tile, carpeting, those kinds of things. So when you're looking at, let's say you're in the, you sell furniture or you're an architect or you do interior work. So much of the interior fit out is really for the special use by that business and it can be considered personal property. So you would depreciate that over five or seven years. And then 15 years is land um, improvement. So any kind of improvement to the land, whether it's paving or landscaping or a stormwater retention pond or a retaining wall, all those kinds of things. So when we go out and look at do an engineering study, we're trying to move as much out of that 39 year bucket into these shorter lives. So remember if it's under tw 20 years or less, you are able to take the bonus depreciation. So we are literally building a report that carves out all these assets into their correct bucket. So what you're doing is you're accelerating the depreciation, which means I'm basically Creating, pulling it forward and using those as a losses today against income. So it's a tax deferral, which in effect increases cash flow. So if I am creating losses against my income, I'm going to pay less in taxes, right? Because it lowers my taxable income. So you're not increasing the amount of depreciation you're getting, you're just moving it to an earlier year. So it's really all about the time value of money. So for those of you that like don't like words and you'd rather just look at a graph. This is my, I, I put this together. So you have the, the, my, I call them my buckets. So the, the, we were talking about the 39 year life for commercial or 27 and a half year life for residential. So those are things like your, your base building, your core and shell. We're all real estate people. So we know what that is. And then our tangible personal property is that five or seven year. And then the land improvements is the 15. And so if you're taking out of the 39 year or the 27 half year into five or seven, that is what is eligible for bonus. And the land is not depreciable. So remember we took that out at the beginning. So hopefully that kind of graphically shows you what we're talking about. So now under the new tax law, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we are right now in 2020. So through the end of 2022, we're at a rate of 100% which is, is pretty phenomenal. And what the other thing that happened with the, the tax 
the new tax law is I didn't say, it wasn't just on new construction and renovations, it's also on acquired assets. So if I'm acquiring a building and I do a cost seg study on it and I move into that five, seven and 15 year bucket, I can take 100% of whatever I put in that bucket in the current year. Um, so what we're seeing is a real uptick in people wanting to do this. I mean, I get calls from people saying, you know, we've always invested in multifamily. Can you tell me what are some of the property types that are even more aggressive as far as getting a lot of um, accelerated appreciation? Because they're looking for investments where they can max out their, their tax savings. It's a, it's a strategy that they're using. Now, if you'll notice, starting in 2023, the bonus amount is going to go down 20% a year, and it expires at the end of 2026 when it'll be 20%. So this is great because if you're planning a project, and let's go back to the folks that are, you know, doing tenant improvements and things like that, this is a great time because you're basically being able to write off a lot of that project. Um, and the small projects are, which we never would even look at, um, are, are, can be, I mean, it's not huge, but it's helpful. And I mean, this is an example of a duplex rental home that was acquired at the end of 18, and it cost $300,000. And we moved 17% into personal property five year and only 3% into 15 years in the city. Um, and you can see if we had done this cost side before the new tax law, the first year tax savings would be 3277 but under the new tax law, it's over $20,000. So for a small investor, you know, that can really be helpful. So I guess the takeaway on all this, just so we all understand the power of bonus depreciation, is it's just a huge incentive. And the cost segregation studies use as the primary tool to document and support using these shorter lives and taking these big deductions. So what we've seen is just so much recent legislation, just one thing after another that has come out that has really helped um, make, you know, it, it, it makes sense to do these studies because you're getting that accelerated depreciation um, faster than you would have before. So I know that's a lot, but I wanted to kind of just give you some background as we move into this next section. So Lisa talked about sort of the third item was the qualified improvement property. Did you have a comment? Are you well, ready? I was just going to mention that the interplay of why um, you and I work together so much is because the CPA can't do the study, nor can the real property owner. It has to be done by a firm like yours. So that's the interplay of all the parties. Right, and we can't do what Lisa does, all this analysis that she was talking about. And if you do the accelerated appreciation, how is it going to affect your net operating losses and the this and the that? And, you know, I'm like, Lisa, you figure that out. So we are basically <laughs> a cog in the wheel. And they, you know, they're sort of the quarterback of the team. But it really works well if you, you have a good relationship like that. That's a good point, Lisa. So under... Um, under the new tax law came this idea called qualified improvement property. So the definition is, and for anyone, if you're a lawyer or you do interiors work or you have clients that are doing renovation work, this is huge. So what it is, it's any improvement to an interior portion of a building, which is non-residential, so you can't do this on multifamily or nursing homes, the improvement is placed in service after the date the building was first placed in service by any taxpayer. And, and, but it can't include anything structural, like the elevator, escalator, or structural components of the building. So picture this. <laughs> You're working on a, a law firm that's taken three floors of a big high-rise office building, and they're spending $5 million on their tenant improvement that they're doing. And and 90% of that falls in this category. Maybe 10% is structural in nature. Okay, so put that in the back of your mind. Think about projects that you might be involved with where there's tenant improvements going on, okay? So now that we will move on, and Lisa, you know, I've mentioned several times that we keep building on all these tax laws, but the idea of this qualified improvement property has kind of been around for a long time. And it's kind of had all these different iterations and different tax laws. And I know you're not going to spend a lot of time on this because 
but I think it's important to kind of say, how did we, how did we get here, you know, over time? So uh, if you look at the slide that's presented here, um, the two items that are in gold on the left-hand side, um, it was very easy and straightforward that it was a 15-year recovery period in the earlier years, 2004 all the way through um, 2018. Actually, I guess it's uh, September 1st, 2017. Um, when, the, when they changed the act to the TCJA Act, um, in writing that act, they missed some language which allowed for it to continue with the same class life of the 15 years. And by missing that language, and it was an error on their part, um, it defaulted to becoming part of the overall structure of the building and became um, a longer recovery period. So it became the life of the building, the 39-year property. And they weren't able to fix it easily, so we've sort of been hanging in like Neverland for the past like year, year and a half or so as to when it was going to get fixed. And they managed to actually put the corrected language through as part of the CARES Act. So now we're back to it being a 15-year property the way it should have been all along. So it was basically a hiccup um, where the blue star is, but it's now been corrected. So once again... That was a, Lisa, that was a, a drum roll right there, right? <laughs> yeah. That was, that was definitely what everyone wanted. <laughs> right. So if you look at this graphically, what Lisa's talking about is, remember our buckets? So now you see this QIP bucket in the middle. Anything that is considered qualified improvement property, it's internal and it was placed in service after the building was originally placed in service and non-structural. It's, it's considered a 15 year asset. And remember anything under 20 years or 20 years or less is eligible for bonus. So guess what? We're in 100% bonus. This is retroactive to when the new tax law came into effect, which the CARES Act, as Lisa said, fixed this. So think about your clients that maybe did big projects back in the end of 17, in 18, in 19, where they did a big renovation, or they did a tenant improvement project, or they were the landlord for contributed to the, the project. They were counting that pretty much as 39 year property under because of this glitch that Lisa was talking about. So all of a sudden, you've got this QIP that is available. To, and remember, this is where I wanted, I said, remember to this, the losses, the carry back that Lisa was talking about. Lisa, you, you might wanna just jump in here for a minute and I really wanna bring home this point that it kind of all starts coming together. So we've got the ability for qualified improvement property to be 100% Bonus. So if a typical project's 90% of that you can, is QIP, you can write almost the entire spend off either going backwards or in this year or going forward through the end of 2026. So Lisa, remind us that you have this flexibility that you were talking about to go backwards and, and, and specific to QIP. Right, so, so specific to the QIP, what we're seeing now as a result of all of this is, as Terry was saying, if you had improvements in 2018, we're actually going back in on several clients doing analysis that it may be beneficial for them to file amended returns for 2018 so that they can get the benefit of the, the bang for getting their cash back um, rather than, you know, leaving things the way they are. So, so that's, that's really been a huge change right. under the CARES Act. A lot of your planning is around that, that, that this is one of the things I'm considering is what if they made that election for the 163 day, but you can't take bonus on the QIP if you made that election. So some people might be saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've decided not, and there were ways that you could back out of that. So it's just been for the folks that do what Lisa does, it's been a, a lot to deal with. Um, so this um, slide, I, I'm not going to go over this. And if anybody wants this slide, I'm happy to email it to you. Just let me know and I'm happy to send it out. But the far left side, the blue, is what we're under, which replaced everything to the right. 
which we had for a long time. Okay, so the qualified leasehold, restaurants, retail. So now we just have qualified improvement property after under the new tax law and going forward. Um, and, and then we fix the glitch so we can take the bonus now um, going back to when the new tax law came in. Um, so Lisa, I think the next couple of slides are yours. Right. So, and I think we've covered some of this already because um, I think we've probably been trying to beat home that the, the, big, the big key here is really the bonus depreciation and the 15 year property because there, that's the that's the real piece that will allow individuals to um, get deductions or shift shift deductions back into an earlier period. That's going to free up cash that they probably could use today or you know in the future, and just get them the real bang for their buck. So um, that's really what this slide is talking about here. And then, and, and this is really the next slide is, this is why we actually care about this because it's crucial because everybody's struggling now. So it's, it's anything you can do to alleviate their pain. Um, and that's, that's what, you know, that's what keeps your, that's what keeps people up at night. And if you can do anything that, you know, helps to alleviate that, that's, that's a value that, you know, a tremendous benefit that will always, you know, benefit you in the long run. So, um, you know, it's, it's just this whole correction of the QIP has been a real uh, boon to property owners and development and, you know, allows that projects that might be coming up in the future, um, they're also going to get, you know, better tax deductions and meet more on a more immediate basis which will cost them less up front than it otherwise would have done had they not gotten that correction through the tax law. Well, it was interesting, Lisa, that after, you know, when COVID kind of hit at the same time, the CARES Act obviously came out right after the COVID was really kicking in. And one of the things we did is we went back, all of our projects we had done that had QIP at 39 years, we fixed it to 15, updated reports, and proactively sent them out to all of our clients. So I think I'd have to, I don't know the exact number, but I know last time I checked, we were up above $150 million in tax savings through that one change in the stock law. My little company, just reports that we sent out saying, oh, that QIP that we had before, well, now you can take it, write it off. So it's pretty in incredible, the impact of that. So I just wanted to run through a couple of examples. One is uh, uh, a, new, a new construction in a, a tenant improvement situation. So in this particular case, um, we moved about 28.6% to five year. Um, and the basis is about $870,000. So with bonus on the QIP after you have the effective tax rate, they got about $336,000 in real tax savings after they applied the tax rate on, the, on that, which is just incredible compared to the almost 100,000 they would have gotten without it. Um, the other example I wanted is we talked a little bit about um, acquisitions. So this is, would be an acquisition that happened in August of 2018. So we're under the new tax law. Then they went in, which we see a lot of is, you know, somebody buys an apartment complex and they renovate it. So the total basis between the acquisition and renovation is about $38 million. They had 15 three-story three buildings, 360 apartments, lots of amenities. So under the new tax law and being able to take 100% accelerated appreciation on the five and 15 year, and you'll see we were able to accelerate 24% of this asset into five year personal property and almost 6% into land improvements. So our total acceleration was about close to $11.5 million. And then when you apply the effective tax rate, it was close to $4 million in tax savings on this one project. So, um, I mean, it's, it's actually pretty mind boggling when you start looking at how that can impact a project. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you would, I just want to touch on this really quickly and then we'll just jump into questions. Does that sound good? Um, yeah. I, yeah, so I just 
quickly want to mention that there's also was an extension of energy incentives that had had ended at on um, um, December 31st of 2017. So if again, if you've seen companies that have renovated or you know done major renovations and they've had energy efficiency in mind, that there are energy incentives where you either get tax deductions or tax credits depending on the situation. So I'm not going to get into that. That's almost like a whole other class. But I did want to let you guys know that we're very active and seeing a lot of this. And certainly, um, Lisa and I and our clients are interested in this. And I just did a big 179D project for one of one of the partners that Lisa of Lisa's that um, it was just a huge amount of savings that because it was retroactive, was able to take advantage of this. So it's another way to kind of go back and pick up savings that you might not have gotten because it had, they brought it back. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And then the last thing that we wanted to do is just take any questions. And Lisa, I am going to stop my share so that I can jump over and see the chat box, which I could not see. So if you guys have, it's really weird not to be able to see you. But if you have any questions, um, can you type them in real quick? And Lisa and I would be so happy to answer them. Or you can email either one of us as well. But um, we would be so happy to answer any questions. So Lisa, while we're waiting, did anything come up for you during that that you wanted to further clarify? Or do you think we? Um, I think it's just really um, important to stress that um, what your firm does is something that the IRS um, looks at that they don't challenge the studies that are done by the cost segregation firms. There, there's a certain acceptance to that information because none of the other parties in the chain are able to actually, as you said, do what you do so that we can do what we need to do. So it's part of the process, but it's something that the IRS has for probably what, uh, 15 years, that's been their policy. And they actually do have engineers on staff that audit these. So if they see something done like by a cap stamp, they're not going to really pay much attention to it because the report's really well done and and, they're, and it's documented. So it's like they're going to pick on people that sort of did it more in the back of the envelope that don't have that backup. And um, and I, I, I think it's a good point. And the other thing I think is when you're looking at collaboration is that, like, say we and I are, have a client <laughs> we're working on together is we really look at all these different tax incentives and and everything that like I might for a list and say well we could do we could write off assets we could accelerate this we can you know lots of ideas expense this but she might say well there's a reason that we can't do that because of blah 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 so I think it's I think she made the point a couple of times that it takes a lot of you know, it's kind of like you you do one thing, but it can affect something over here. And so there, you don't want to oversimplify this stuff. The, the, I think the strategic planning around these tax solutions are just as important. As, I mean, to make sure that you're getting good advice about them. And, and that's where someone like Lisa, like Eisner Amper really comes into play in working with Lisa, that you see that. Um, oh, we have a question that's come in. It says, if we install a new fire system and finance it, is the project still eligible, say, $600,000 X project? Lisa, did you, did you see that? Uh, no, I think I got the next, the next question. Okay, so it says, if we install a new fire system and finance it, is the project still eligible? So as long as, I guess what I would say, and I, I would be interested to hear what you think, as long as they're buying it and financing, paying it off over time, as long as they're not leasing it. So if you own it, you can depreciate it. Correct, Lisa? Right. Correct. Yeah. Because you would be setting up the asset as well as um, the loan related to it. And the next question is, how long does a cost segregation study take generally? For example, if a company purchased a 1 million square foot office building, um, I would say the normal turnaround time is about six weeks. And depending, you know, we can be pretty nimble during the tax filing time because we'll, you know, you're just, everything's accelerated and we end up doing things sometimes on a little faster schedule. 
because you have to always work towards when the tax filing is and try to make that deadline. But I would say in general, most projects are going to take at least four to six weeks from start to finish. I don't know if that's what you see. And, and, and keep in mind that the CPA has to review it and then apply it into the tax return. So they don't want to be getting it. The tax, taxes are due on July 15th. Lisa does not want that report on July 14th. She wants it probably two weeks ahead of time. Right, Lisa? Prefer. <laughs> I always put my plug in for you. <laughs> you. You don't want things at the last minute. <laughs> Um, anything else? Oh, we've got one here. Um, oh, from our friend Amanda Ryland is on the call today, guys. Um, as a furniture provider, how would you recommend I share this information with my clients as it relates to their furniture purchase? Well, I mean, I would assume furniture is a seven-year maker's life, right, Lisa? Yeah. So that is under 20 years. 20 years, so you're looking at 100% bonus. So Amanda, I would make sure that they know that they can write that off through the end of 2022 in the current climate. They can write 100% of that purchase off. Um, so you're depreciating it, you're just writing it off right away. I don't know, Lisa, if you want to explain a little bit more how that would work. Tack, um, um, I think you got that part of it. I think the one thing that I would add to it is that it might be one of those items where if you have a client who's looking to make a purchase at the end of the year, they might want to make the purchase in December and shift it into uh, 2020 and get the benefit of it right away as opposed to the next year, depending upon some of their other circumstances. If they, you know, have the opportunity, it could potentially, along with other items, create an NOL that they might be able to carry back to a more profitable year. So it's just that um, you can give them the um, knowledge that the bonus is out there, and then you can also just give them some things to think about in terms of how it may play within their overall picture. See, I told you guys, there's always a strategy. <laughs> I simplify and Lisa figures it out. <laughs> But the, the other thing is, Lisa, we can't really get into this at all, but there's a whole other set of regulations about expensing that if, if they are, quote unquote, a de minimis expense. So if any item is under, say, $2,500, so Amanda, I know you've got probably some pretty expensive furniture, but if on, a, let's say, chairs or $500 a piece, you could also expense under an expensing mechanism that for a, per unit is under $2,500. So that's, I don't want to get too much into that, but just so you guys know, there's also other regulations that allow for, instead of um, capitalizing it and then using the bonus depreciation, you can expense it, which is, Lisa, does that have kind of the same impact at the end of the day? It has the same impact, and the key really is to just make sure on the invoice, the invoice could say $10,000, but as long as the per unit pricing is below 2500 it has to be listed on the invoice in order to use that. So if you have five chairs at $2,000 a piece, uh, or five desks at $2,000 a piece, um, and it's $10,000, you could actually expense that because it's under the de minimis amount of 2500 Or you could yeah. write it off, you could capitalize it and write it off as a bonus depreciation. You have two options, basically. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hopefully, Amanda, that helps. Um, okay, so Jordan's got a, a question. Would, would pool building renovations be eligible as well? Due to COVID, some multifamilies are unable to open their pool. Thinking that renovation would be a great way to upgrade their facility with budgeted money. Curious on your thoughts. Jordan, I'm sorry, but rem I, I just got to uh, remind everyone that the QIP doesn't, um, multifamily projects do, are, do not qualify for qualified improvement property. I don't know why, I think it's kind of odd, but they don't. You could, if it was an outdoor improvement, a land improvement, you could, like a, a land improvement would be here. So if the pool was outdoors and all the improvements were land type improvements, the pool outdoors would be a 15 year asset and you could take the 100% on that and other renovations associated with that. So we would look at the renovation five 15-year property multi-family project and we would try to push as much into that 
those categories and take the bonus on that. But that if there was some 39 year property, you wouldn't be able to take bonus on that. And just so you know, FYI, pools that are indoors are a 39 year asset. If they're out of doors, they're a 15 year land improvement. It's kind of, there's all these little nuances. Um, let's see. So I don't see any other questions. I think we're, we're coming to the top of the hour. Lisa, did you have any last um, thoughts to leave on? Um, I thought I'd mention one more thing. When you have a cost uh, segregation study done, um, they break down the all the costs of the, the building and by its units of property, which we didn't talk about, which is also probably another whole discussion on its own. However, one of the stipulations is, which applies a lot to real estate, is that you're always supposed to have a unit of one on your books at any time. So if you ever have a cost that that uh, cost segregation study done, you can at a later date, say for instance, you need to replace the roof, you can actually take off the cost of the original roof and use the same process for the new roof to be put on. So, you know, I just wanted to mention that's another little nugget along the way to think about if something's not a new property, but it's something that, you know, is maybe older, but needing to have work done. And then we, we look at those like write-offs all the time. They're um, just, especially when there's major renovations like this, Jordan, your example, where you're talking about doing some renovations, if you were actually replacing assets, you write off the balance of those assets and you're capitalizing the new. So that was a great point, Lisa. Um, gosh, there's so many things you could talk about. <laughs> that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole couple hours in itself, right? That whole the right. tangible property rights. So we are coming up at the top of the hour. There's, hi, Rosemary, how are you? I just wanted to Pop thank back. you guys. <laughs> Pop back in. Uh, <laughs> thank you both for, for uh, taking the time and answering all these questions. I think it's a fantastic job. Uh, so uh, there weren't any other, other questions to answer. We've been through them all, I believe, right? I think we've got them all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I thank you. Know where to find us if you need us, right? So. Yep. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you again, and see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.